and he uh, and he was talking. You know, that's what he was originally setting out to do when him and I met. And then seven years go by, and he's doing better and sober and recovered and put his life back together. And it just seemed like the most appropriate title was never be done. And as soon as yes. I came, as soon as, as soon as I said it out loud, it just felt right. But but uh, you, uh, you did start filming uh, Richard uh, like a couple of years ago. Uh, was your project to uh, to uh, to make a, a film about his um, his uh, his career at first? No, no, it was yeah. um, we were Richard was uh, or he still is, but at that time he was a working comedian in, in Vancouver and in Canada. So he was known quite well in the underground comedy circuit. And uh, I did comedy when I was younger, when I was 18. And a friend of ours, who's also the producer on the film, Danny Mendelo, he, um, I reached out to Danny years ago wanting to put Richard in a web series I was shooting at the time called The Backshop Show. And Danny just remembered that, that I wanted to work with Richard. So. Richard was looking for someone to put together a tape, um, film some stand-up sets for him, and, and, and then ultimately film his one-man show. And Danny recommended me to Richard. So he put together a Facebook chat, and then me and Richard set up a time to go meet. And um, yeah, we just met and started talking. And the idea of it was just starting out at first was, well, I'll just start filming you now and just start filming you know, your everyday life and how you write your material, how you prepare for to do a one man show and just have all this cool behind the scenes type of footage that would correlate with the one man show DVD. Um, and then when things started getting going, you know, I, I just stuck with it. And then, you know, it, it turned into what it turned into that you see today. Yes. So, so uh, Richard, uh, tell me, um, uh, I, I, uh, the, the film is very interesting because it traces a lot of, about your, uh, your uh, career and your personal life. Wh while I was watching it, I was wondering, was it difficult for you some time uh, to shoot and to talk to the, cam to the camera while you're facing a lot of personal problems? I'm. Uh, I didn't quite hear your question. Um, yes. I'm, I'm, Again, I, I will repeat. I, I was. I was telling you. I was uh, while I was watching the film. I uh, and of course the film traces your career and your personal life. Mm -hmm. You know, for for um, a couple of years, and you've been through a lot during these years. You know, and what uh, I was wondering if it was difficult for you. To, uh, to talk to the camera and to explain your situation while you're facing this kind of problems because, you know, it was, yes, yes. Yes. Mm. It's a very long question, Sharif. <laughs> <laughs> My yes. answer will be just a little bit longer than it. Um, well, you know, uh, the, the part of the, my life that Roy recorded the most was pretty blurry to me. I was pretty much out there at that point. The, uh, the effect of the alcohol and drugs had taken me to a, a place where, you know, I, I was just, um, you know, with no stretch of the imagination, I was out of my mind. And, um, you know, I think it's fairly clear with me writing on the walls and just being, um, you know, as belligerent and as toxic as I was, the things that I was saying, the self-destructive nature. Um, so the fact that there was a camera recording it, um, yeah, you know, it's interesting, Shri, because, you know, at the very beginning, Roy uh, insisted that we uh, have a deal, which is that he would be the camera, he would be the director, and I would be Richard Lett. And so he didn't show me any of the footage until I saw the film already edited and, and produced at its, its first uh, screening at the Whistler Film Festival. I didn't see any of it. And so I had no way of, of 
number one, manipulating it, and, and number two, uh, um, being worried about it. You know, I just sort of uh, trusted Roy with that. And so um, I think what's interesting about the, the documentary is this, how authentic it is. And it's because I'm not really playing to the camera. I am to a degree. I'm a show off, I'm an entertainer, I'm a comedian. I'm going to, you know, like say outrageous things. I'm doing it right now the way I'm wiggling my head. But, <laughs> but the notion of, of, you know, what Roy was seeing, what the camera was seeing, I was not aware of at all. And I think that's uh, one of the strengths of the film, right? Yes. But um, tell me, uh, uh, because um, I, uh, we, we saw a lot of footage, uh, you know, since your beginning, you know, when uh, just uh, being graduated uh, and, and studied to become like a teacher, then you, uh, you start up, you know, when you were a young man, you know, um, I understood that you accidentally ventured into the stand-up stand a comedian career, you know, right. correct? Yes. Correct. Yes, but what can you tell me about the Canadian audience? Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, what kind of material they respond to okay. according to your experience? Well, it's a good, good question. Um, Canadian audience is for my... Uh, they respond to according to your experience. Well, yeah, it's a it's a feedback. Oh, we're getting an echo. Okay. <laughs> okay. Am I alone in this now? Great. Good. Here we go. Canadian audiences, which you just asked a couple of times, um, are um, smart and and have I think um, a real uh, taste for uh, stand up comedy. You know, Canadians are viewed worldwide as being really funny. Americans will happily admit that if you're a Canadian, you're probably funnier than they are. And, um, you know, and that's, I'm not bragging or stretching the imagination. Somewhere between the English and the American, right? So we're, we've got that kind of mix. The, the English and their ribald, Benny Hill, sort of over-the-top sex... Uh, innuendo, double entendre stuff, and then you have the American, which is very political and social commentary, and you know the kind of Lenny Bruce and you know George Carlin raging against the machine sort of thing. And so somewhere in the middle, I think, is where where Canada lies, where we're not afraid to you know do kind of ribald, dirty jokes and make fun. And, and we're also, I don't think, intending to change the world with our commentary. Um, so we're not very political and we're not very racial. When you do comedy in the States, the first thing the comedian walks on the stage, he identifies his ethnic background. I'm Italian-American. I'm African-American. I'm, you know, uh, Japanese. -American. They're all about that. You rarely see that in Canada. We have comedians getting up and saying, oh, I'm Irish Canadian. Like nobody cares, right? <laughs> they don't, um, you know, it's not, race is not um, a thing for us. I'm not saying that there isn't racism. I'm not saying that there is not, you know, ethnic uh, challenges in Canada, but it's just not something that we spend a lot of time, you know, being, you know, I, I, it's not our identity. Our identity is clearly, um, not American and not English. It's almost like our identity is based on what we're not and what we don't care about, right? So very rarely do we get up and talk about the prime minister. There's not very many comedians that do that or do Trump jokes or 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 also you know start raging against the the, the Fifth Amendment or whatever. We mostly talk about life and and our experiences in relationships as as fathers as husbands as you know or wives and you know all that stuff there's a, there's a strong dynamic of, of 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 variety in canadian comedy i think um that there is you know a lot of 
of that sort of, uh, uh, you know, I know lots of, of female comedians and have never um, ventured into uh, this notion that they were being withheld or, or kept off the stage. Same thing with um, the, uh, you know, the different uh, diversity of, 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 of ethnic uh, things. We've got all sorts of, you know, uh, Asian comedians. You know, I know a few of them. There's people with different abilities. A good friend of mine, Vic Albert, has cerebral palsy. So, you know, I just don't think, I think what's different about Canadian comedy is that we're not too worried about it, you know? You know, really, there's yeah. not a lot of canceling going on. I mean, if anyone's going to get canceled, it would be me based on this documentary. And <laughs> I mean, what does the guy have to do to get canceled? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Roy, uh, tell me um, how uh, how much footage did you shoot? You know, how much rough material you had? Um, uh, thousands of hours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I how, I don't have an exact number, but um, yeah, I got, I got, uh, yeah, I got, I have a server at the studio, and this movie takes up a ton of it. So <laughs> yes, but but I see they are from different sources. There are VHS tapes. There are uh, news. You know, how did you uh, uh, started the process of compiling the film? Um, well, uh, when Richard was getting kicked out of his apartment. And he was moving out. <laughs> I uh, I scored that day. That was a, a bad day for Richard, but an excellent day for the director. Me. <laughs> so he was uh, he was on his way out, and there was a there was a case of. Uh, gosh, I still have it. Mm -hmm. Still have it. Yeah, it's right in here. Yes. So. Um, I, uh, I, there was a, there was a, there was like a case of, uh, of, uh, of VHSs, like a few of them just sitting there in, uh, in his closet or something like that. Or he pulled out of his closet and they were just sitting in the hallway or something. And I, and I was like, what's this? And he was like, I don't know, just a bunch of old tape. And I was like, sweet, can I have it? And he's like, sure. And then I threw it in my trunk and dragged around with me all these years and digitized it and went through it all and marked off the places that I thought were relevant to what story we were telling. And, and then, uh, and then due to technology, too, uh, YouTube is really helpful. There's, uh, there's stuff on Richard on YouTube. So I was able to pull a lot of stuff off of YouTube as well. So that helped. Yes. You know, there's, uh, been, Sharif, there's been a camera being pointed at me for a long time. So, you know, when you ask like, what's the deal would it be self-conscious you know i yes. you know there's the camera pointed at me right now and you know whatever yeah uh, uh, yes. to add to richard's uh talk about uh comedians in canada um i i i i agree with them i, I think what it is with canadian entertainers in general is that they don't take themselves too seriously and that can be to their detriment and it can also be to their benefit, right? You know, you look at like Jim Carrey, right? He's a great example of just never taking himself too seriously, but really funny, right? Um, so, and same with Seth Rogen, like we're able to po poke fun at ourselves. And that helped with, uh, with the making of the documentary, you know, is just being able to, I was able just to film Richard and, and, uh, and not, feel like I'm like, oh, I'm getting this shot or I need this today. It, it felt organic for me to be able to just go out there and start filming and, and not, not, not have someone who's taking themselves that seriously, but was in a very serious situation. So yeah, it's yeah. Canadian filmmakers and entertainers. I, I, I think that that is a, is a good point that they don't take themselves too seriously where feel like some people can take themselves too seriously and then it just kind of becomes lame you know yes and uh, richard uh, tell me how do you think uh, about your writings how did your writings i think you write your own material correct or did you, did you ever use any other writer did you collaborated 
did you collaborate have you collaborated with other, other writers in your career for your uh, jokes and for your performances hello i think he froze up oh, I'm uh, back. Really? oh there he is. yes back in town okay he wants to <laughs> know jokes I <laughs> I think they generally stand-up comedians write their own material. Certainly, the ones that I know, not not the ones that have TV shows where they have to crank out a monologue every night. That would so they have a room full of writers. But that being said, um, you know, there's certain comedians that I will call up and say, "Hey, I'm working on this. You know, I'm doing a, a show for a, a recovery show um, because you know I'm sober, and one of the things that I end up doing is is lots of shows." Um, in support of people in uh, recovery from alcohol and drugs. And so I'm doing a show this Saturday. So a friend of mine who is a comedian, um, you know, I will call him up and discuss some of the jokes that I'm working on. And he'll go, well, what about this? Or, or you know, like give you an angle there. So um, no, he would never suggest, oh, well, you owe me a writing credit or anything like that. There's another thing that happens with stand-up comics, which is we are – very often tagging each other's jokes in in the sense that there's always you know within a root a bit you have like basically have uh, a topic so a premise and you have three jokes and that are all about that and then you have a tag and that tag it changes um the whole meaning of the joke and so what often happens is that a comedian will be watching another comedian doing, a, a, you know, material, and because they are not as invested in the topic as the the comedian performing, they have this ability to look at it from a sort of a, a different angle, and they'll say, "Hey, I got a tag for you," and they will come over and 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 tell you the tag, and and then they'll give it to you, and 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 they're again not expecting to be given credit for it. That's just one of the things that we do for each other. I got a tag for you. And sometimes comedians will use them, sometimes they won't. I used to do a long, an extended bit about my talking car. I had a, you know, a, a New Yorker, uh, and a 95 New Yorker, it was one of those cars that said, you know, your, your, car, your door is a jar, your seat belt, you know. And so I did this whole bit about fighting with my talking car. And then one of my buddies in the back said to another buddy, Richard doesn't need a car that talks. He needs one that listens. <laughs> and so they laughed and I talked to them afterwards and the guy told me what had happened. And I put that at the end of the joke and it's just like, boom. So um, the short answer to that question is, Yes, I write all my material. I write all my slam poetry. I write plays. I write. I'm writing all the time, but um, I do it uh, and try it out on on people. Sometimes just the general public, like I was doing to Roy before this interview. I said, "What do you think about this one or that one?" And but also with other comedians and have them help. So. Um, you know, we're, we're actually pretty supportive of each other in that, in, in that regard. And uh, and it gives us a certain amount of pleasure to see a tag that we've given to another guy uh, succeeding. So, um, so, yeah, we write, but we also share. Sharif? <laughs> Sharif, yes, are you still I'm there? here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you didn't lose me. Uh, I was telling Roy about uh, the film uh, winning Best Documentary uh, at the Hollywood South Film Festival, correct? Yes. Yes. Tell me, how was the film re received? It was um, it was online or uh, it was among live audience? Uh, live audience. This is all pre-COVID. Uh, yeah, pre-COVID. Um, yes. Yeah, the audience really seems to... Um, respond well to the to the documentary which is nice and then also since it's been released because you can you can rent it right now or buy it on any of the streaming platforms um so all the reviewers and film critics and stuff like that out there have all have given it really positive reviews 
And, um, and then in front of a live audience, it's always fun going to the movies, you know? And then when you're watching something that actually moves people, it's a powerful moment. Um, you know, the Just for Last Film Festival, there was a standing ovation. And um, uh, I wasn't there for that. Richard was, but he said it was pretty powerful. There was, it was over mm -hmm. people there. It was packed and it was a standing ovation. Whistler, you know, people were coming up to me and Richard both at the end of the Whistler Film Festival just sharing with us, right? Like, you know, want, want to talk to us or me or Richard alone and just share their experience of their own struggles with addiction or their own struggles with a, a family member that maybe or a friend. Um, and uh, yeah, it's powerful um, when you're, when you screen something live that actually has a purpose and a meaning because most of these documentaries that come out about addiction, like the person's dead already or they die at the end or something, you know, and at the end of this one, Richard's alive, you know, and he's doing well and he's, you see the transformation of his entire being change over this course of time and it's rare so i think people got a really good perspective of if you don't understand addiction and you don't understand alcoholism maybe you have a little bit of a closer understanding of it and you're not so harsh to judge or you're someone that struggled with it yourself and you understand it and it's a beautiful thing to see that individual change and overcome right um i've had people reach out to me privately after seeing the the film when it was released and uh, wanting to talk, you know, they messaged me on Facebook, or whatever, just want to talk and, uh, and I'll listen, you know? So yeah, it's, uh, it's doing exactly what I'm hoping it, it will do, which is, you know, bring hope to people and open up a conversation around addiction and, and a discussion and, and it don't just be something that's swept under the rug, you know? It's crazy because it's like you were living in a pandemic where you know all they're talking about is people dying but like more people died of a drug overdose today than people died of coronavirus and more people died of addiction of alcoholism i love when richard says this like we don't even know how many people die of alcoholism because you can't count it right yes so you know what i mean like it's good that it's getting out there and that people are finding it and and it's creating a conversation and i hope it continues to do that and uh, yeah, I'm willing to talk with anyone about it. About it. So thank you for giving me the time. I mean, Richard, you might have to add to that. You were there at the just for last. Yes, yes. What was that like? Yes. Well, uh, what what did you think about the film? Seeing it among among people, Richard. Me. Yeah. <laughs> well, the first time I saw it, it was like, oh my god. Um, you know, Sharif, I, I really didn't know how rough it got for me. You know, I didn't know that 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 I was going to die. I was on the brink of death. I know that, um, you know, lots of people have remarked that as they're watching it, they thought that it's possible that Roy might show up and I might be dead. And even I was going, I don't know if this guy's going to make it, and I'm him. So, um, you know... <laughs> And this one podcast we did, Roy, I remember the guy um, watched, worried that I might not live. And he goes, oh, wait a minute. I'm interviewing this guy tonight. So <laughs> clearly, clearly he did live. And spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen the film, I survived. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was uh, initially shocking and uh, uncomfortable and and frightening and um, embarrassing uh, to see what I was like that time period. Take the worst couple of months of your life and film them. And I, you know, challenge anyone to, you know, face that and not be a little bit thrown by it. The, then. So we watched it the first time on the and Whistler, and then there was a second screening the following day, and I watched it that time, and I went, "This is a good movie. This, like this is this is a quality film that Roy has created." And so I sort of allowed myself to be the to let it go and have it not be about me now, and let it be that guy then, and then. 
you know, within the world of recovery, we are um, challenged to help other people and to tell our story. And that's how we stay sober and clean. But it's also, <laughs> excuse me, um, the responsibility that we have to, to help other people and to show them that there is hope and there's, there's a chance for them. And I think that film was a long way to doing that, to show how far down a man can go into his disease, into his sickness, and how, you know, you know, through the years, how he manages to return to to a place um, that's not just as good, but even better than where he was before. So that's, um, it makes me proud. I was proud to see the film. Um, but of course, it's, you know, tough to see yourself uh, in such rough shape. But, yes. oh well. Yes. And Richard, uh, right now, um, are you uh, back to performance again? You have other shows coming up in the next period. Well, yes. I, I mean, after I did, like, the, the film never be done, it ends with... Um, me touring with a with a one man show about recovery, right? Called yeah. Sober but Never Clean, and so the the performances at the end are 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 edit are scenes from that one man show, um, using the same format of music and poetry and storytelling and stand up. I got a grant from the Ontario government on a thing called um, Word of Mouth. And they uh, gave me money to, to develop another show. And this one had to do with me having uh, testicular cancer. And so I, I used the same style to do the, the show about the testicular cancer called One Nut Only. <laughs> Get it, Sharif? It's very clever. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and so I did One Nut Only. And then... Um, then I was I was going to go to the Vancouver Fringe Festival. You know, Fringe Festivals are good opportunities to do new work. And I had done the show uh, a bunch of times at in comedy clubs and other venues doing, you know, one not only, you know, part of a, a fundraising thing for the um, the uh, mustache guys who are they, um, you know, the guys that raise money for, uh, for men's cancer. Um, Movember, right? So I did I did some stuff for the show for them. And then I was gonna do the same show for the Vancouver Fringe in September, but in July <laughs> I got uh, COVID. COVID nineteen. I was I was test I tested positive for that. And really? also, yes. And so I had um a five-day headache and fever and chills, but fortunately I had a light bout of it. But um, then when it came time to do this show in September, it seemed a bit, I don't know, been there, done that, to do a show talking about how I survived cancer 10 years ago when I just went through COVID-19. And so I saw another comedian and ran into him and... <coughs> He was regaling his friend about all the stuff I've gone through, cancer and recovery and now COVID. And he said, you should do a show called Hard to Kill. <laughs> and I went, oh. And so what I did is I did a show that, um, that dealt with all those things. And, and mm -hmm. so I was you know, able to bring it up to speed. <laughs> yes. There it is. Yes, hard to kill and hard to COVID as well. <laughs> I know. This, um, you know, it's hard, hard to hard to imagine. I mean, you know, my yes. friend called it the hat trick of deadly <laughs> diseases. Um, yeah. And uh, but you know, it's strange to be me and have you know face this stuff and have people say that after the apocalypse they'll be. Keith Richards and me, um, <laughs> Brown. Um, but um, 
it also seems like uh, my capacity for taking uh, difficult life challenges and turning them into, you know, comedy um, is the reason, you know, the point of me not to become rich and famous or, you know, and I think one of the values of the film in a strange way is of um, never be done is that I'm not a celebrity. I'm not famous. And, you know, we get to see the, the struggles of a journeyman stand-up comedian and, and get to view into that world, but more so, um, you know, a person, uh, just a guy who tells jokes for a living and who lost his way and uh, through the help of, you know, um, a fellowship of people that suffer from the same thing and a power greater than himself, he was able to, you know, come back and get well and then get COVID and tell that story, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Roy, uh, do you have uh, upcoming documentaries or pro project coming ahead? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not one I can discuss right now, but I am uh, in the uh, process of, of documenting something. Yes, so uh, <laughs> let's wait and see. <laughs> yeah, hopefully this one doesn't take 10 years. <laughs> yeah. yes. It would be easier. Yeah. Okay, guys. Yes, uh, I want to thank you very much, director Roy Tig and uh, artist and comedian Richard Glenn Litt for uh, joining this uh, discussion about their films. Best wishes for uh, this year and the upcoming period. And uh, uh, I hope uh, all the best for uh, Richard, you know, for his upcoming shows, more, more fun, you know. And Roy, uh, more success with your films. And uh, hope, hopefully next year we can uh, have you as well, uh, you know, live, you know, without uh, cameras and uh, online discussion. We can attend a screening together, you know, and everything will go back in place. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, that would yes. be great. Uh, thank you, Sheree, for uh, inviting our film into your festival. Um, appreciate it. And thank, thank you for telling for us. Thank you. Let us know if Roy wins any awards. You know. Of course, we'll do that. We'll do that. We'll we'll uh, we'll we'll yeah. send. Uh, yes, we'll we'll whistle blow. <laughs> do some whistle blowing. <laughs> if uh, if if there's an award for biggest jerk, then maybe I have a chance. <laughs> but, uh, or, or best supporting actress in a documentary, Brianna Lett. Brianna, yes. will, yeah, my daughter will crush that. Yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. But, uh, yes, 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 of course. Me. I, I <laughs> do, I, I, I'm in a movie called All Joking Aside where I play the owner of a comedy club and the, the lead character, so I, I'm in a sporting role, the lead character is a washed up alcoholic comedian. And so when they, uh, they brought me in to read for him and then they, got a name actor guy guy from Mad Men to play the lead and then they brought me in to play his best friend and they said to me um do you have any questions before the audition I said yeah why'd you give away my part <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all, all joking aside is is out there in festivals uh, now as well and so I do uh as well act in and play other people besides Richard Lack. <laughs> it's a hell of a character, I gotta tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's good seeing you. Have to play. Thank Hard you. To Thank you very much, and uh, uh, best wishes uh, for everybody. And uh, and uh, good night. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us. And maybe Roy will make his money back. You know. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <That'd> be great. <laughs> Bye bye. Good seeing you, Richard. Thank you, Sharif. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. See you later, Roy. <laughs> <laughs>